Thank you for being here on this Wednesday night, and glad you're here. And we'll go ahead and let you remain seated, and uh, we'll open up with a word of prayer tonight. And since Mike is standing there, he... <laughs> Mike, I'm just going to have you open us in a word of prayer, if you don't mind, please. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing the chorus, I will serve thee because I love thee. And again, I'll let you remain seated for this as we sing this together. We're going to sing it through twice. I will serve thee because I love thee. You have given life to me. It's a privilege to serve him, isn't it? And it doesn't matter if you're a pastor of a church or you're working behind a, a counter at a grocery store somewhere, you're always in his service. You're in the king's service, and it is a privilege to serve him. Hey, I want to just uh, recognize tonight Ashley, and uh, many of you remember Brett Shores. Uh, Brett attended here for a good period of time, uh, and they now live in Ohio right now, so they're down visiting family. and. Uh, possible chance they're going to move back to this area, but we're glad to have Ashley, and and uh, make sure if you haven't had a chance to greet her, you greet her tonight. Let her know you're glad she's here. Well, we'll go ahead and take a look at our missions letter, our missions letters from our missionaries to Scotland, the McLennans. They were supposed to have been with us back in the spring and had some changes to their schedule. They went back to Scotland early, so hopefully next time they're here on furlough, we'll get him back in. He's a brilliant man. He has a lot of degrees. I was really shocked. I was reading his um, 
bio and just a tremendously brilliant man in Scotland there. Anyway, it says, Dear pastor and church, once again, it is our privilege to let you know how God is working in Scotland. We have been back for a couple of months now, and it has been a blessing to see God work and grow people. Our church is doing well, and we are having a lot of visitors to come to our services. In the last few weeks, we have, had, we have five men come to our church, some of whom have traveled long, a long distance to be with us. It has been a great encouragement to our people to see God bringing in new men in the church. One of our ladies, called Blanca, who is saved, has a husband called Robert, who is unsaved and is an alcoholic. He recently had a car accident while he was driving drunk, and the police caught him. He is facing court soon and is very worried about what might happen to him. Now you have to understand that we have witnessed to Robert many times about his need of salvation, but he always waves us away and says he is fine. As he is no longer able to drive, he and Blanca have been coming to church by public transport for the last few weeks. We are praying that God works in his life and shows him how lost he is and how he needs the Lord. Our outreach ministry continues to be blessed. and We are seeing many opportunities to give out the gospel in the street and door to door. One of our men works as a fisher, our fish seller, and he recently was able to lead a young man to the Lord, which was a real blessing to him. Our family is doing well, and we are glad to report the birth of our first granddaughter. She was due in August, but she decided to come a few weeks early and was born five weeks early on the 13th of July. Both mother and child are doing well, and they decided to call her Sky. We have waited a long time to be grandparents, so as you can imagine, we are thankful for the new birth and gives us opportunity to really spoil them both. I also had a good witness with my youngest brother, Alan, who is battling cancer. He really listened to what I had to say, and we continue to pray for his salvation. We are thankful for your prayers and support and the privilege to be used of the Lord here in Scotland. We live in dark times, but thank God for all of you and for the light of his word and for faithful churches and friends that allow us to continue to make a difference here in Scotland. So uh, Brother McLennan's brother, Alan, uh, is, has been very hard to the gospel over the years. And so while you hate for anyone to have to battle cancer, asking God to make it an avenue to open his heart up that he would receive Christ as a savior. And the other gentleman, Robert, you know, the, the alcoholic. God can use these things to tender people's hearts. So please pray for Robert. Please pray for Alan. And then they have a very special unspoken and uh, just continue to pray for that. And that reminds me, on the back of your prayer list, you'll notice on the back page, they're called missionary requests. We separate these out just because of the needs that some of our missionaries have. Uh, of course, A.B. Childs has uh, two members of his family, a gentleman by the name of Harold and a young woman by the name of Tori that both have cancer. And then Kim Howell uh, has been battling cancer. Bob Yader, still don't know, uh, haven't had any indication by his last few newsletters about the benign tumor that was at the base of his brain. So I am assuming that he is doing better or doing okay now. Uh, Susan Sly, uh, she had strokes, and they found swelling of her carotid artery and migraines. And again, their last newsletter we got in this week, I think it was, made no mention about her health, so I'm assuming she is doing better. Alethea Wilt, seven-year-old, has leukemia. Uh, she's going through very serious treatments right now. And those treatments, I'm sure you're aware of this, especially if you're involved in medicine, can be life-threatening in themselves. Uh, even a seven-year-old, I guess, is subject to heart attacks through the types of treatments she's going through. I had a chance to talk to Dave a few weeks back. Our New Beginnings class, we're doing a special project for all their kids. And uh, he said she's doing pretty well, but they still have two more years, two more full years of treatment to go before she completes treatment. So she has a long road ahead of her. And then, of course, the request there by the McLennans. All right, let's go back, if you would, and to the middle page there, and really want to, again, encourage you to be in prayer for Rich Tozier and his family. His wife's name is Angela. Their daughter's name is Heather, the one that's still with them. The other kids are in school now. But they will be here September 4 through 8, and just asking God to really work. I really want to thank you for the good response to fasting. Uh, most of those slots are filled up. And I appreciate you being willing to take time 
give it to the Lord in fasting to pray for this upcoming meeting. We've had a good response to people volunteering their homes for our prayer meetings. There's one spot left, if anybody's interested, for the north side, that'd be Bridgeport, Fairmont area, if you were interested in that. And then we're getting a few more names, special requests for people uh, to be prayed for by name. So a reminder, our men, again, it's the first Saturday of the month. We meet here in the, in the Nisley Room at 9 o'clock, as we do each month. And we'll have prayer time. Now, some of our regulars are going to be gone this Saturday. So if you've not been to it or haven't been here for a while, you want to come and join us in prayer, I encourage you to do that. But we'll be focusing on the meeting with Brother Tozier. We'll be focusing on those people whose names have been submitted for prayer. So keep that in mind. Same page, uh, the expectant moms. You notice my daughter's been added to that. She's about three months pregnant now. And um, just if you would, uh, pray for her. She has had uh, quite a bit of trouble carrying children. Of course, we have Naomi. And so, so far, three months, uh, she's been doing very well. So if you pray for her continued uh, blessing in that. And then Misty Jett, of course, uh, you'll remember her by a different last name when she was here, part of our church, but she is due right now. So uh, she still has not had the baby out there in Tulsa, but pray for her and her husband, Josh. Her last name now is Jet. So just pray for them that the baby would jet right in, and I'm sure she's ready to give birth to that child. Mallory is not that far off. What, another? She's due this Saturday? Oh, I thought it was September. Oh, well, okay. Then pray for Mallory, too. That, so she's due this Saturday. I don't know why I was thinking September. Okay. All right, here's a name to add to the prayer list that we were given. Ron Dahl. It's just like a, a doll you play with, D-O-L-L. -L. Ron Dahl, he had open heart surgery yesterday up at Ruby, a triple bypass. Pray for his recovery. Ron Dahl. I'm going to make a special note of a few folks. Um, um, a gentleman by the name of Bob Yakulis, and he's there at the bottom of the list. Uh, Jessica and Justin, it's a friend of theirs, and he has had cancer, and he had a really good report here. Just yet today or the other day, the PSA level has come way down. That's a big answer to prayer. But you also notice on the spiritual list, he's an unsaved man, and he needs the Lord, and they've been witnessing to him. So just pray that God will use this to make him see his need for Christ. A few names above that is Harriet Williams. Uh, this is uh, my, part of my wife's family, one of her aunts. Uh, Harriet is 82, 83, 84 now. And she was rushed to the hospital about two weeks ago. And they called the family in. They were certain she was dying. And the Lord has chosen to raise her back up. And she was taken home today. And so that's nothing short of a miracle. I don't know what the long-term prognosis is, but it was just amazing because no one in the family thought that she would survive. And then up above that, Ashley Stuchel, this is my niece. Uh, well, my nephew's niece, she's 35. Uh, she is a nurse there at Western Reserve Hospital up in Cuyahoga Falls. And she was diagnosed with cancer. Uh, she had surgery to move her thyroids, and they found the cancer had spread into her lymph nodes. And so she is going to be going through treatment. The other day, uh, we went to Ohio on Saturday to meet a couple of my niece's husbands that we've never met before and meet a little grandniece that we never met before. So while we were up there, Ashley was supposed to come, but she was sick and she just stayed home. Uh, at that time, her hands began to freeze like paralysis. And so Sunday morning, they rushed her into the hospital and make a long story short, the doctors there at that hospital told my nephew, Matt, that she probably had uh, Galen's bar syndrome. And those, I know Ashley and uh, you, you will know, you know the seriousness of that disease. Praise the Lord, uh, now they said it is not. So that in itself, she still has a long battle with cancer, but the fact that that was not heaped on top is a, is a huge answer to prayer. So would ask you to just pray for her uh, that God will intervene. Uh, there's, I don't know why hospitals do this, but there's been a long delay from the time they operated it till the time they start treatment. So. It's frustrating uh, their family, so if you would pray about that. 
All right, let's go ahead and we'll take any updates, any praises, or any new requests. Amy? That's good that he does not have cancer. That's an answer to prayer, too. By the way, the Tanner girls are going to be singing through the week during our revival meeting with Brother Tozier. So we're looking forward to them singing, with, singing for us. Anyone else? Any updates? Uh, Jane. So just remember Jane's mom, Angie Philippine, with that cancer. Joan, did you have your hand up too? Okay. I actually had your name down there, so I must have forgot to put it down. So we'll... Okay. All right, so their daughter, Ginger, as well. Um... I'll make a note of this also. We have many, many requests, and uh, not so much for our members, but folks that are added that are non-members. If they're on there for a long time and I get no updates, I really don't have much of a choice but to remove them because we don't have enough room with new requests coming in. So if you do see a name that's removed and you want to put back on, you're welcome to do that. But I just kind of guess after two, three, four months, somebody being on the list, it's like I don't hear anything, don't know what's going on. So at times we'll remove them. But again, if there's someone that was on there and you want them back on, you're welcome to add those names back to the list. All right, anything else, Jeff? Lord. Do you want us to keep her on the list or? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, John, did you have your hand up too? Yeah. Did he have his statistics final? Okay. Okay. So he asked for prayer for that in class the other night. So if you think about that for Sammy, pray about his statistics final in that class. So he goes back to school in two weeks, two weeks. Yeah. And he will be a junior this year. It's hard to believe. I don't understand it because I'm not getting any older. I don't, I don't understand how he can be advancing like that. All right, let's take our Bibles tonight. We're going back to Proverbs chapter 3. Now, I do need to make an explanation about something because... Some of you, I know, are wondering, if you parked up top, you may not have realized this, but we have started over here. There's been work done. There's materials brought in in the back. So two weeks ago, or a week and a half ago, when we had our meeting, pretty overwhelmingly encouraged by those who were in the meeting to go ahead and start the construction for the at least the bathrooms, if not both the bathrooms and the kitchen. Now, I cannot just simply spend money even though it's it's already decided we're building this and all that you know having to transfer from the general fund to the building fund but this company Huffman Corporation has workers that are available to start now and so they ask would you allow us to come in and just go ahead and start basic things and so if you've been over there you know those great big holes with the with the covers over top that has always been a concern by a lot of folks about people tripping over those those have all been filled in, and they're starting the uh, frame of the entire middle section. So just in case you're wondering, well, why are we doing that since we haven't actually had the meeting? Number one, I'm very confident that one of the two options that we have talked about will be voted on because you guys have basically said that's the way we're going to vote. But secondly, um, we do have money that can you know, pay for what we're doing right now. And even if on the 14th, 
you know, by some strange phenomena, you know, the vote would be no, we don't want to build the bathrooms, we don't want to build the bathroom and kitchens. We have more than enough money to do what we're doing right now. And if nothing else, that'll be done and out of the way. But since they have a number of workers that are available, he just said, we're willing to start if you'll allow us to start. You give my men something to do and it will get you ahead on your project. So we decided to let them go ahead and do that. So does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so if you want to walk over there tonight and see, you're welcome to do that, but it is uh, getting underway a little bit. So we'll be working on that at least for a few days. All right, Matthew, or every single week I've said Matthew. I got Matthew on the brain. And I'm not even reading in the book of Matthew, but I got Matthew on the brain. Yeah, you probably could. Probably get the same value out of it anyway. All right, Proverbs chapter 3. We'll have a word of prayer and we'll get started here in just a moment. Father, I thank you for everyone who's here tonight. Thank you for the opportunity just to have a book called the Bible that is true. Lord, we take it by faith. It is a book that demands faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please you. But I can testify, and I believe everyone in this room can testify of the reality that this book has brought into our lives, not just our salvation, and that would be more than enough. But we have watched you work through this book to convince us of your power, to convince us of your love, to see you answer prayer, to do good works in our lives. It's not a life free from burden or pain or sorrow, but it is a life that sees you work through all those things. Thank you for this book, the book, the book of books. And I thank you we can take just a few moments tonight to study it here again in Proverbs, and I pray you bless the study of your word here in the kids' club tonight, in the teen ministry. Lord, even work in the nursery this evening, we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our focus tonight is going to be on verses 27 through 35 of chapter 3. Now, once again, we're looking at the instructions of a father to his son, or we could say a father to his child. And as we've examined the first seven chapters in general, you constantly see these statements as begins chapter 2, My son, if thou wilt receive. Chapter 3, my son, forget not my law, and so forth. We see these my son statements. And so here's a conversation, a conversational portion of the book that directs the father to instructing his son how to live, how to live. As we've looked at this book, especially these first seven chapters, Solomon makes a big deal about the strange woman. I, you know, no doubt that it was inspired by the Holy Spirit, but you know the trouble that Solomon himself had with women. And who better to instruct someone than someone who's gone through problems in instructing his son, don't be lured by the strange woman. But in these first seven chapters, there is paragraph after paragraph about not giving yourself to immorality, not giving yourself to fornication, not going after the strange woman as she stands in the street and calls young men, simple young men, into her life and entraps them and destroys her life. And the Bible says in Proverbs, she, her path is the way to hell. So Solomon makes a major, major deal out of that. Much of these seven chapters are filled concerning that. What's interesting is these chapters also deal with another woman, a woman in, in uh, how can you say, in appearance, not, not a literal woman, but wisdom. When wisdom is portrayed as a woman in these chapters, and she too stands out, if you will, on the street corner. She stands there in the high place calling young men who are simple to come in, not to take them to hell, but to give them God's wisdom and to give them life. So he makes this comparison, and we have examined all those things through these first several weeks. And then last two or three weeks, we've been looking at chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, and there are six admonitions. We mentioned last week that six is the number of man. Six admonitions here, and you notice back at chapter 3, the first 12 verses, they're paired in twos, verses 1 and 2, verses 3 and 4, and so forth. 
and it's an admonition to make God's law my law. God's commandments, my commandments. And he goes on to talk about trusting the Lord, fearing the Lord, honoring the Lord, and not despising the chastening of the Lord. So there's these admonitions that the Father says, now, son, listen. When, when you do wrong and you step out of line, God's going to chasten you. Don't despise him. Now, son, there's going to be some things coming in your life you're not going to understand. Trust him. Now, son, if God blesses you, you need to honor him with, with the first fruits of thy substance. You need to honor him. So here are the, these admonitions. And then it goes back into the wisdom section. And then when we come to verse 27, it brings us into a new portion. And we'll read this together beginning in chapter 3, verse 27. Withhold not good from them to whom it is due when it is in the power of thine hand to do it. Say not unto thy neighbor, go and come again, and tomorrow I will give, when thou hast by thee. Devise not evil against thy neighbor, seeing he dwelleth securely by thee. Strive not with the man without cause, if he have done thee no harm. Envy thou not the oppressor, and choose none of his ways. For the froward is abomination to the Lord, but his secret is with the righteous. The curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked, but he blesseth the habitation of the just. Surely he scorneth the scorners, but he giveth grace unto the lowly. The wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be to the promotion of fools. I headline the title here tonight, Loving Your Neighbor. Loving Your Neighbor. I want you to notice again in verse 28. Say not unto thy neighbor... And so this is dealing with, if you will, neighborly relationships. And my mind went back when I was studying this to what Jesus said to the lawyer in Luke chapter 10. You remember the account where the lawyer says to Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And so Jesus responds and says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, strength. And then he said, and love thy neighbor as thyself. And then, in response to that, in Luke 10, 29, this lawyer said, but he willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So something must have brought conviction to this man when Jesus said, you're to love your neighbor like you love yourself. Well, who is my neighbor? I don't think it was just a legitimate question. It was like, a statement that showed a sense of guilt, self-condemnation, if you will. And in essence, Jesus concluded his answer. You know, it's the story of the Good Samaritan. He concludes his answer by basically saying that a neighbor is anyone who needs your help. Remember, it begins, the parable begins, says there was a certain man who went down or went from Jerusalem, from, went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And he fell among thieves, and he was left for dead, and a priest wanders by, and the priest passed by. Then a Levite came and saw the man in his need, and he too passed by, and then finally a Samaritan came along. Well, you know the great love that the Jews had for the Samaritans, and the Samaritans were the Jews. Well, not really, and good reason. I mean, for the Jews, they had, they had faced the Samaritans' wrath when they returned from Babylon. Uh, the Samaritan army did everything they could in their power to thwart them militarily, and then they went and uh, uh, challenged the kings of Persia to send orders to cease the construction of the temple and of the, of the walls of Jerusalem, and they succeeded for a number of years in doing so. So the Jews had no love loss for Samaritans. So it must have sounded strange to this Jewish lawyer to hear that the hero of the story is a Samaritan. But sure enough, the Samaritan came by, and the Bible says, when he saw the man, he had compassion on him. And he knelt down, and he bound up his wounds. He put him on his beast, and he took him to an inn and paid the innkeeper all that was needed to take care of him physically until he recovered. At the end of that parable, Jesus said this in verse 36. Which of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? He looks at that lawyer and he says, which of those three do you think was neighbor to this man? And of course, the lawyer had no way to respond other than what would have been obvious. 
I suppose the Samaritan was the neighbor to this man. So you can equate that a neighbor is not necessarily someone who lives next door to you or lives inside your duplex or that lives in the general vicinity. It's anyone who needs your help. It's anyone who needs my help. This is the way God equates what a neighbor is. And so again, we're going to look at these two verses, first two verses, verses 27 and 28, and simply note that God is saying through Solomon to his son, and he's saying to me as his son and to you as his child, I want you to do good to your neighbor. I want you to do good to your neighbor. Look again at verse 27. Withhold not good from them to whom it is due. We're to do good to those who are due our goodness. Those who are due our goodness, we're to do good to them. And I want you to think about this for a minute. The Samaritan's good was due to a complete stranger. When you go back and read that account, he knew nothing about this man. In fact, of the three, of the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan, the one who would least likely have known this certain man who descended from Jerusalem down to Jericho was the Samaritan. Samaritans didn't have much dealings in Jerusalem itself. They were not welcomed there. Just like the Jews would not go into Samaria, the Samaritans were not welcomed to Jerusalem. So this is a complete stranger to the Samaritan, a complete stranger. And yet he took time to aid this man, to do good to him. The one who represented religion and the other one who represents the law, the priest and the Levites, forgo their responsibility and left it up to a man that everyone else despised. That man that was despised was the man that aided this man in his moment of need. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Who is that? Jesus. The picture in that parable is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the good Samaritan. Jesus Christ is the one who's despised. Jesus Christ is the one who cares for you and me. When I pray and I take time to praise the Lord Jesus, I will say, thank you, you are my good Samaritan. You care for me when others would not. And that's true. If no one else cared for me, Jesus Christ does and always has and always will. He is the good Samaritan. He's the good Samaritan to you. He's the good Samaritan to anyone who's willing to welcome him. And he says, we're to do good to those who are due our goodness. And so to whom is our goodness due, if you will? It is due to a complete stranger. Now, when I was young and I heard people preach, men preach on that parable, they would always give this analogy of that certain man who went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. They would say, Jerusalem represents a place of being in fellowship with God. Remember, it's the holy city. It is the city of the great king. In Galatians, it is referred to as the, the emblem of faith, whereas Mount Sinai is the emblem of works and of the law. Jerusalem always elevated in scripture. Jericho is not. Jericho was cursed. Jericho was destroyed. And when Joshua fell the city and took it, remember he pronounced a curse on that city. Any man who tries to rebuild this city within his family, he will lose his firstborn son and, you know, that prophecy. Well, that actually came true. There was a family who did, I think it's listed in the book of First or Second Chronicles, a family who rebuilt Jericho, and in the midst of their building, their firstborn son who started the project died in the midst of it. The prophecy was fulfilled. But then you remember the prophet Elisha coming in his circuit to Jericho was appealed to to purify the waters because the waters basically were poisoned, another evidence of a curse. And God in his mercy allowed Elisha to perform a miracle that purified the waters so that the inhabitants of that area could use those water sources again. But again, Jerusalem, place of being right with God, Jericho, man, you are out of fellowship with God. It says he went down, again, emblematic of his backslidden condition. 
Now, if you, if you buy into that, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with buying into that thought. I think it's a good, good analogy. Then when that Levite passed by, his reasoning may have been, why should I help him? He got what he deserved. I've said that before. I may have not have said it out loud, but I have said that before in my heart about people. They got what they deserved. They don't deserve my help. When the Good Samaritan comes by, he's already hated. The Levite and the priest would probably have passed by the Samaritan without looking at him. But that Samaritan took time to care for the one that Jesus said is your neighbor. And though you may think he does not deserve your help, the reality is that's the one that God wants you to reach out to. Second thought, I want you to look at James chapter 2. Go to James chapter 2. And we're going to read verses 1 through 9. James chapter 2. Verse 1 says, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For, there is come, for if there is come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand out there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you, and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by the which ye are called? If ye fulfill the royal law, According to the scripture, now notice this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin, and are convinced of the law as a transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Then jump up to verse uh, 6, 15. If a brother or sister be naked or destitute of daily food, and one say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? So again, the thought being we are to be good to our neighbor. And here you find the brethren's good was due in this passage to the poor, the Samaritan to the complete stranger. Here, the brethren's good, the believers, the church family's good is due to the poor. It's hard sometimes, isn't it, not to show favoritism. It's hard sometimes not to show favoritism. This person can't do a thing for me. But that person can do a lot for me. It's very hard not to show favoritism sometimes. But God makes it very plain in his word there is to be no favoritism. And when there is a need for help, you are to reach out and to honor the poor. We're to honor the poor. It's a question that we have to answer for ourselves. You know, even in our own church family, there are people who are very well-to-do, and there are people who are not well-to-do. How do we respond to those people? Do we show an attitude of favoritism? And sometimes, quite frankly, is there an attitude of, just like with the Levite and the priest, that man got what he deserved, Sometimes we come to this conclusion, you know what? They mishandle their money. You know what? If they just educate themselves a little more, they'd have a better paying job kind of, kind of attitude. We better be careful. We better be careful in the way we assess. God says if you are to be a good neighbor, if you are to do good to your neighbor, then you have to recognize the complete stranger no matter where they're at spiritually, as your neighbor, you've got to recognize the poor as your neighbor. And thirdly, I want you to go over to 1 John chapter 3 to notice this, 1 John chapter 3, the believer's good was due to the brother. The believer's good was due to the brother. 1 John chapter 3, we'll begin to read in verse 15. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. 
Hereby perceive we the love of God. He said, this is the way we understand God's love. This is how we're sure of it. Because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Okay, how is that manifested? Because most of us will never, ever be required to do what Jesus Christ did. Especially in our country, in our culture. Not many of us, if any of us, will ever have to die a martyr's death. That's not true in Nigeria tonight. It's not true in Myanmar. It's not true in Afghanistan or Iran or North Korea, but, but it is true here. We don't face those kind of things. So how do people perceive the love of God in you and me? All right, verse 17 has the answer. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? How dwelleth the love of God in him? If you're like me, it's difficult sometimes to want to let go of money. Especially, you know, with inflation, the way it's going out of, out of control. And sometimes it's just hard to want to do these kind of things. And yet God said, we are to do good to our neighbor. And in many ways, in all three of these examples, there was, there was a financial cost involved. Most things go through the vein of money. Let's, let's be honest. It's a tool. And that's really all money is. It's a tool. That's why we should never really get clingy with it because it's just a tool God has given us to honor him and bless his kingdom. Something else I want you to notice here. We're not only to do good to those who are due our good, but we're to do good when it is in the power or the ability of our hands. So you say, well, I don't have that ability to do what the Good Samaritan did. Or I don't have the ability, you know, to do what the believers here in 1 John did. That may be true. So what do we do about that? Well, we look at the teaching of Scripture. So go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and look at verse 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and look at verse 8. Second Corinthians chapter 8. I'm going to begin to read in verse 8. God's word has solutions, and he says, I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the for forwardness of others, and to prove the sincerity of your love. Notice that. I'm going to prove your love. How do you perceive the love of Christ? Well, he laid down his life. Okay, we're going to prove our love. Verse 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. Am I willing to become poor for somebody else's sake? I didn't think about that earlier today. I'm thinking about it right now. Would I be willing to be made poor so that somebody else could benefit or become rich? Yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. And herein I give my advice, for this is expedient. In other words, it's profitable for you who have, been, who have begun before not only to do but also to be forward a year ago. Now, therefore, perform the doing of it. Just do it. Just do it. Don't talk about how you love people. Don't talk about how you want to meet needs. Don't talk how you want to be good. Just do it. Remember the Nike slogan, just do it. And that's expressed back in 1 John. He actually uses the words do it. And here again in 2 Corinthians, he says, we're to perform the doing of it. Just do it. He said to these Corinthians back in verse 10, at the end, he said, you were forward a year ago. In other words, you were bragging a year ago about how you wanted to help your brethren. Now just put up or shut up. Do it. Just do it. Perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, I mean, you're all excited and ready to do this a year ago, so there may be a performance, notice that, a performance also of that which you have. For if there be first a willing mind, it always has to be there. If you're stingy in your heart or your mind, you will not give. And I'm talking about helping your neighbor in need. I'm, talk about, I'm not talking about tithes and you know, faith promise. I'm talking about ministering to people. You will not minister to people, and I will not minister if there's not a willing mind. And there's only one person that can change your mind, and it's not Pastor Vaughn, and it's not Jeff Sims, and it's not Grant Smith or any other teacher we have. It's the Holy Spirit of God. 
For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. For I mean not that other men be eased and ye burdened, but any, by an equality that now at this time your abundance may supply for their want, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be equality. So bottom line, he says, look, you may not always be able to do good to your neighbor. You may not always be able to help the poor. You may not always be able to help that stranger. You may not always be able to help the brother that's in need. But when you can, do it. Just do it. Do good to your neighbor. When God has given you in power of hand the opportunity to do it, do it. Now, again, if you're like me, you know, money is not something that grows on trees. It's not just laying around everywhere. It's precious. And again, I emphasize the fact of what we're going through with the inflationary rate and all the issues we're facing is becoming more and more precious. And so the thought of helping somebody else when I need all the help I can get kind of attitude makes it difficult. But this is how it, we, we can overcome that. And I just think about what Jesus said in Luke 6, 38. I remember these words. I, I use this in one of our, my messages here recently. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. What, what are you being prompted to do? You're being prompted to be a good neighbor. A man giving to another man. Or a woman giving to another family. He said, if you will give, I'll give back to you. I'm not talking about planting a seed and reaping a thousand. I'm not talking about that garbage. I'm just saying, God said, if you will honor me and be the neighbor you ought to be, I'll make sure you're taken care of. And I bet if we just paused here, when I said, start standing up and testifying to this truth, I would bet that every single one of you could stand up and give an example of this truth. I know I could. God will do those things. And then he ends that by saying this. Jesus said, for with what measure ye meet, with what measure ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you. Now notice this, again. I think the word again, in part, means this is the normal Christian life. This is part of the normal, you know, Watchman Nee in the book, The Normal Christian Life. This is part of the normal Christian life. Solomon sits down and says, son, I want you to be a blessing to your neighbors. I want you to minister to your neighbors. I want you to do good to your neighbors. No, no, I'm not talking about your cousin down the hall in the palace because that was probably the extent of his son's friends, you know, isolated by, you know, imperial guard and all the things that would go along with especially Israel at this state in their history. No, no. Son, go out and find someone who's a complete stranger to you. Go out and find someone who's actually poor. Because you're not going to find any poor people here in the palace. Go out and find someone that is not a brother in the flesh, but a brother countryman, another Israelite, minister to them. If you can do good to your neighbor, do good. If you can do good to your neighbor, do good. We'll look quickly at verses 29 and 30, and we'll shut her down for tonight. Go back to chapter 3 of Proverbs, verse 29. Devise not evil against thy neighbor, seeing he dwelleth securely by thee. Strive not with a man without cause, if he hath done thee no harm. And here, he says, do no wrong to your neighbor. Number one, do good to your neighbor, verses 28 and 29, verses 30 and 31, or rather verses 29 and 30. He says, do no wrong to your neighbor. Well, that's a good policy. Because I certainly don't want someone doing wrong to me, and I'm sure you don't want people doing wrong to you. So he says here at the beginning of verse 29, devise not evil against your neighbor. Now, I want you to keep in mind, a neighbor might be a stranger. A neighbor might be a stranger, as it was there in Luke chapter 10. He was depicted, again, as a man who was in spiritual decline. He left holy Jerusalem and went to the cursed uh, uh, Jordan, or Jericho. Jericho, yeah, Jericho. 
So if there's credence to that analogy, then we're being told this. Even if you think someone deserves to be, in a sense, uh, mistreated or gotten back that, in other words, our attitude is, what I'm about to do, this brother deserves. He's wronged me. He's wronged others. So he's going to get his comeuppance. You know, we're going to make sure that he pays for what he's done. Here's, here's the attitude. Don't devise evil against your neighbor. Don't devise evil against that neighbor who might be in a backslidden state because your evil won't convince him to get right with God, will it? Devising evil against someone that I think is not where they ought to be spiritually is not going to get them back to where they need to be with God. But being good will. Romans chapter 2 says, do you not know the goodness of God leads men to repentance? I have, I have a niece who's very, very far from God. And over the years, I've said, God, if you have to judge her, judge her. And he has. She's come near death several times. But then I'll say, God, you know, you said in Romans chapter 2, you said, the goodness of God leads men to repentance. And God, if you would be good to my niece, if that would convince her to turn her life back to you, please do it. Whether you have to judge her, and God, you know, it's your wisdom, whatever you have to do, draw her back to you. And I know all of us have family like that. We all have family we want to see get back in fellowship with God or maybe be safe for the first time. But I can devise evil in my heart towards someone with the, with the uh, justification that they deserve this. Maybe you've been wronged by someone. They deserve this. But God doesn't want us to do wrong to our neighbor. Part of my evil, I'm talking about Jeff Vaughn, part of my evil against even someone I try to pretend is not my responsibility is, is to say, you know, that, that person put themselves in their situation, they're, they're getting exactly what they deserve. I'm glad I don't get what I deserve from God. Amen. Because if I got what I deserve from God, and, and this is true for you too, and you know it, we would all be in the pits of hell right now. We would. I don't want people to get what they deserve, no more than I want God to give me what I deserve. So why should I give people what I think they deserve? Devise not evil, evil against thy neighbor. Notice also in verse 30, he says, strive not with the man without a cause. There is a time for strife. Pearl Harbor brought about strife. 9-11 brought about strife, and those things were justified. But most of the things that go on in our lives do not justify striving with our neighbors, unless there's a cause. When I was a little boy, uh, my oldest sister, well, my second oldest sister, Donna, and of course, Joe and Donna were here many times, and a lot of you remember Joe. He passed away last year about this time. Uh, they had a house on Orion Road there in North Canton, and every once in a while, they just invite everybody to come over after church on Sunday afternoon. And so, you know, when we were done with our responsibilities, we go over there and spend a little bit of time with them. And I remember uh, my brother Jimmy, my brother-in-laws, and I, you know, I was still young. I was still probably 10, 11 years of age, maybe younger than that. We grab a baseball in our midst. We go outside, and they'd have a big place, but there they had a fairly nice length driveway in between some houses, and we would throw the baseball back and forth. Of course, you know, I'm not all that greatly accurate, especially at 10 or 11 years old, so... You know, we're starting to warm up and throw a little bit harder and a little bit harder, and all of a sudden I'm heaving the ball. And, you know, my brother couldn't have gotten the ball if he was eight foot nine. You know, I'm just heaving it over his head. Well, it bounces on the driveway, hits the street, and goes in, over into the neighbor's yard and rolls all the way up to the house. Okay, no damage, no broken windows. It's just laying there, just go over and get it. Except the old man that lived in the house walked out, grabbed the baseball, walked back in his house, and shut the door. No joke. He's just a nasty old man. I mean, he was a nasty old man. And he never did give us our baseball back. No answer. He would not give that baseball back. Now, there is a good ending to this. Later on, my brother-in-law, and you know Joe, he's always happy, and he's just like a big teddy bear. He's just a happy and gentle man. He finally kind of won that man's heart over, and that man eventually, like a year or two later, <laughs> gave us our baseball back, you know. But my attitude would have been 
well, whatever ha bad happens to him, he deserves kind of attitude. And been very easy to fall into strife with that man. I mean, after all, you know, look what he did. But God says, through Solomon to his son, we are not to strive with others. We're not to strive with our neighbors. I want you to go to James chapter 3 for a moment right before we close. And I want you to look at verse 13. James chapter 3 and verse 13. James chapter 3, beginning in verse 13. Who is a wise man? And of course, we're talking about the book of wisdom here. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation or a good lifestyle his works with meekness of wisdom. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. And remember, he says back in Proverbs chapter 3, we're not to envy those who oppress. We're not to strive. Or verse 31 says we're not to envy. Verse 30, we are not to strive. Several years ago, I had a, a controversy at, uh, with, with a Christian. And this Christian, I had bent over backwards to try to be helpful to uh, this Christian. Uh, and nothing I did seemed to satisfy. And then there was a controversy about doctrine. Uh, the person declared I was preaching wrong doctrine. And so there was a controversy that broke out. There was a spirit of division. And I can tell you that these words here in James where he says, where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. And there is a, there is a state of confusion during that time. There is a state of evil work going on. And I remember in the midst of that, I, I'll be honest, I was torn up about it. It was, it was kind of things that make you lose sleep, kind of things that when you go to prayer you can't pray because it's just constantly weighing on your heart and your mind. I, I was not getting, and shamefully, I was not getting victory in my life over it and just had to finally, you know, the Lord dealt with me. But the Lord dealt with me, not with the other person, with me. And the attitude is, you need to be good to your neighbor. You need to be good to them. Because if you're devising evil against a neighbor, if you're, if you're, if you're allowing yourself to go in that direction, you're doing nothing but stirring the strife. Now, I can't keep somebody else from devising evil against me, but rather I can keep myself from devising evil against the other person, right? You can't control the other person but you can control you. You can control you. Now here is Solomon's son. I don't know if it's Rehoboam. It may have been. And if it was Rehoboam, then he is going to assume the throne. And when he assumes a throne, he's going to know what it's like to have people envy him and try to cause strife for him. And he's saying, son, you do good to your neighbor. You do good to your neighbor and do not wrong your neighbor. They may wrong you, but it will never give you justification to wrong them. Never. Now, folks, it's not always easy, is it? Not always easy. Many, many years ago, in another situation, I, I had uh, an issue with another believer, and uh, they had stirred up uh, quite a bit of trouble. And uh, one day, my wife and I happened to be in a, in a restaurant somewhere, and I hadn't seen this person for years, for years. And I walked in, there was that person, and my heart sunk. It's like, if that person sees me, 
they're just going to get up in front of this whole restaurant and just start railing on me and ripping me because they do not like me at all. And I, I, you know, we, we finally got to our seat and it's like kind of turn my back to these people so they wouldn't see me. You know what the Holy Spirit did? He said, get up, go, go say hello to that person. I said, I don't want to go say hello to that person. But he would not let me go. And finally it's like, Lord, I know what's going to happen because I know what happened in the past. But he wouldn't, let, he wouldn't let it go, and he just kept convicting me and convicting me. And so I finally stood up in the midst of this restaurant full of people, and I walked over and I said, hello, so-and-so. And he turned and looked at me, and I was, I was just like ready for the blasting that I was receiving. He said, oh, how are you? Oh, it's so good to see you. And it's like I was kind to the person, and they reciprocated the kindness. And it's like, you know what, Lord, it was, it was worth being obedient to you. Now, would it, now, let me ask you, would it have been obedient to do that even if the person would have turned and embarrassed me in front of that entire restaurant? Would it have been right? Yeah, it would have been right. It doesn't matter what the other person is doing. Never wrong your neighbor. Never cause strife where it's not warranted. Never envy other people. Just do good, just do good. You say, well, these are just practical things. So practical that our nation has none of these graces. Let me say it again. So practical that our nation has none of these graces. They need to see it in you. They need to see it in me. We who are the redeemed, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. How? Do good to your neighbor. Don't wrong your neighbor. And we'll not look at the last part of this tonight, but as practical as it is, it is extremely necessary in our lives. Our let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, I thank you for your word. I ask tonight that you would use it. Uh, I'm, I'm imagining that these things are not issues in the lives of the people who are here before me. But maybe like Solomon, it is worth taking this passage of scripture and sitting down with a child or grandchild and saying, son, daughter, this is how you treat your neighbor. And a neighbor is not someone who necessarily lives close to you or that you like. It could be a total stranger. It may be somebody who's not right with God. It may be someone who's poor. But whatever it may be, do good to your neighbor. And never wrong someone, even though it may seem they are deserving of it. Never wrong a neighbor. Because everybody, in that sense, Father, you've indicated in your word is a neighbor to us. Help us to show the love of Christ. As John wrote and as James wrote, let it be real and evidenced in our life. Take what has been said tonight, use it for good. As people go to prayer now, answer the prayer of your people. Lord, as we walk out of this place tonight, give us safety going home. And we just ask that you would um, use us the rest of the week to bring glory to your name. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.